Well, hello, everyone. It is fantastic to be here. Um, I think there's been a bunch of really good lead up for the conversation that Mike and I are going to have with you uh, this morning. We, I, I was struck by the question that Secretary Perry asked Jerry Brown, Governor Brown, last night. He said, if you had two years more, um, what's your unfinished business? What would you do? And his answer was about transportation electrification, charging the, the vehicles themselves. Well, interestingly, about um, literally about 12 months ago today, I got a call from an investor friend of mine who said, Kathy, I have this great opportunity for you. Um, it would require you moving from Silicon Valley to Los Angeles, but here's what it is. I, I'd love you to take the reins at America's largest fast charging infrastructure company, EVGO. And interesting for me, for somebody who spent 30 years in the clean energy sector, looking at all of these changes and all of the dynamism, something that I had observed is in 2016, for the very first time, emissions from the, electric, from the stationary electricity sector were lower than the greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector. So we have a lot of unfinished business here. But for me, the opportunity to help accelerate the modernization um, and, the, and, the, and the reduction in pollution from the transportation sector was, was too good an opportunity. Um, and I thought, well, maybe Los Angeles isn't so bad. <laughs> so, so my husband and I moved, moved south a year ago. Um, and I took the reins at EVGO. And, and I have been immersed in this transfer transformation since. Now, Mike, my colleague and friend Mike, um, as soon as he finished with graduate school, he joined General Motors, so he is a veteran of this sector and, and has been, again, from his perspective, witnessing similar dynamism. Um, and you know, for a company that's been around, I just, I just read this last night, uh, it's 110th year anniversary, yes. General Correct. Motors. Yep. Um, the, 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 the stalwart um, leader in the, in the US auto industry uh, sold 9.6 million vehicles uh, last year. The, this the GM is a force. We've had many conversations in the electricity panel this morning, Chris's vision on what's happening with AVs. All of this leads us to where we are now. And so we'll spend the next 30 minutes or so having a conversation about what we're seeing as two business practitioners um, trying to accelerate this, this change in the, in the sector. So I'll start with this. Um, GM has a new theme that somebody referenced yesterday that is, is become your refrain, zero, zero, zero. It has. Tell us what that is. So let me talk about 000. Um, uh, Chris, in his talk, referenced the fact that we're seeing incredible change in the transportation industry coming. And he referenced some of the technology drivers behind that connectivity, um, autonomous technology, certain was he talked about it, and electrification. And all three are happening at more or less the same time. And then you throw on top. Uh, a business model change around sharing, transportation as a service, ride sharing, car sharing, and so on. It's become certainly, um, for as long as I've worked at the company, by far the most dynamic time in the industry right now. And our CEO, Mary Barra, has said on several occasions, we expect more change in the next five years than we've seen in the last 50. And so one of the things you do as a big established company that's been around for 100 years you see all this change coming, you gotta put some thought into what's our vision, where are we going? What do we tell people that we're trying to get to? And so one of the things we try and do at General Motors is put the customer in the center of everything we do. And when you look at um, the demographic trends in society, certainly large urban cities, sometime in the next couple of decades, more than half the human population will live in large urban centers. And that'll be the first time in human history that's happened. And so we got pretty focused on transportation in urban centers. And then started thinking about what do our customers want from a transportation system, especially in a large urban center, in this future vision. And although it seems obvious once you say it, at the time it took a little while, but after thinking about it, we came up with this vision of zero crashes, zero emissions, and zero congestion. And that's the zero, zero, zero that Kathy references. Um, because if we can deliver that, and we think we can deliver that using these technologies, not, not this year, not next year, but over time, that's what our customers are looking for. And so Mary stood up last year and publicly announced this is our vision for the company. And it's been a 
it's been just as useful inside the company to signal to all the 200,000 employees of General Motors where we're headed as it has been in our discussions externally as well. And just to emphasize, you know, it's a little bold when today battery electric vehicles are less than 1% of the vehicles we sell to have the CEO stand up and say, that's our vision for our entire portfolio. We're headed towards zero emissions. So that's zero, zero, zero. That's fantastic. I mean, and do you feel it when, when you go to work at, the, at your various Absolutely. offices in Detroit, do, 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 from top to bottom? Who, or is it just, is it just the, the technology people? Is it the marketing no, people? No. Does everybody feel this? It's the company's vision. Right. So everybody in the company has heard this, understands that's where we're headed. Again, they all understand that that doesn't mean we're going to stop building gas engine pickup trucks next year. This is something that's going to take a long time for us to get there. But what it does is it um, gives a strong signal to the organization that if you're working on a project that's moving the company in this direction, then you're consistent with the long-term vision of the company. And again, as big as the company is, it's important to have that overall unifying vision, I think. I mean, from your perch um, and with your tenure, you, you, you see a lot of, of things that are happening with technology. And of course, at a company, you have, to, you have to marry technology opportunity with what's commercially sensible. When we think about the technology innovations that are happening, and we just had this fantastic talk from Yi Chui about what's on batteries in particular, what's most exciting from your perspective on, on, on the technology front that's going to inform and get us to the zero, zero, zero vision? So I think uh, Chris Ermson did a great job talking about autonomous, and I think that's one of the most fundamental aspects, as he said, of moving us towards zero crashes and eliminating all the deaths that currently happen on roads and highways. So I won't spend a lot of time talking about that technology. I think in the electrification area, it's certainly, um, again, consistent with the earlier speaker, battery technology has been the real unlock for why that why this is the time that electrification will happen in transportation. We've been through a couple of hype cycles in the industry over the last couple of decades, and the industry's gotten really excited about electric vehicles, and then they didn't happen at scale. This time it will happen. We're convinced of that. Um, we've announced that we're going to roll out 20 uh, zero emission vehicles between now and 2023. And again, those aren't um, hybrid vehicles, those are zero emission vehicles. And so if you think about that and the way the company, um, you know, we don't have more capital to allocate and engineering resources to allocate just because the industry is going through this period of change. So what's implied in a statement like that is a shift in resources away from vehicles as we know them today towards these zero emission vehicles going forward. So um, I think that's important and then Connectivity underlies all of this. Um, the fact that uh, obviously with the Internet of Things coming together, I would argue the vehicle is probably the most complicated machine most people come in contact with on a daily basis. And so the role it will play in the Internet of Things through this connectivity link, I think is really interesting for the industry. So all of those are, are uh, huge technologies as we think about where we're going. Question for the audience: Hands up if you've if you've driven not not just ridden in but driven an EV. Okay, brave people. Hands up for folks who have not. Okay, well that's it's probably 70, 30 that have that we're at Stanford, we're in Silicon Valley, so that's not unexpected. I mean, I thought Patty Poppy's observation yesterday that the EV always gets the the best parking place in Detroit was a funny one because in here they're fought after here in Palo Alto and certainly in Los Angeles as well which which brings me to another another topic area which is the competitive landscape right so here we're ground zero for Tesla Tesla had I mean, Elon announced amazing results um, a, a couple of weeks ago. The Model 3 has indeed achieved its ramp of thousands and thousands and thousands of vehicles. Um, you know, the, 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 the EVs in the market in the United States doubled between June and September. So it, it just, it's, it's obviously on a huge tra trajectory. The data that I have is that more than $100 billion, $100 billion of investment by auto OEMs or automakers um, to get EVs onto the road by 2022, and that doesn't even include the Chinese manufacturers for whom we don't have data. There are literally now 400 individual companies in China in the EV business. So this is a giant, a very significant competitive landscape. 
what that amounts to is 160 new EV models that, that you guys are gonna be able to make choices about purchasing in your next car purchase decision by 2022. So this is, we're at an inflection point here. So question for, for how GM thinks about this competitive landscape. I mean, do you see that you're competing EV to VEV? Are you saying your EVs are gonna compete with plug-ins or, or internal combustion engines? Or is there some sort of weird thing coming in from the side about hydrogen? How do you think about winning in a competitive landscape given that you're GM? So um, I wanna emphasize one of the points you made, which is China, because I think sometimes here in the US, we get a little wrapped up in what our national policy is, but any global automaker sees China moving very aggressively, arg arguably more aggressively than any other country in the world towards EV vehicles. And so uh, there's a huge incentive for any global automaker to be doing electric vehicles for China, for nowhere else. Now, again, with our vision, we're gonna work very aggressively here as well. To your question, and it goes back a little bit to the vision. Um, if you say as a company that your vision is zero emissions, then it becomes pretty clear when you think about it, you, better, you should spend your time trying to get those zero emission vehicles to work. And so we're not spending nearly as much effort on hybrids because we see those as somewhat of a transitional state between, where, between ICE engine vehicles and eventually zero emission vehicles. And so we see the goal is zero emission vehicles and we see the goal is those replacing ICE vehicles. So it's not that, again, you know, the market's not gonna grow. We're not gonna sell more vehicles per year because we offer zero emission vehicles. They're gonna replace our ICE fleet over time. Very good, very good. What are you guys seeing um, in terms of the impact of tariffs? <laughs> So tariffs are uh, obviously a, a very dynamic subject right now. And, and as complicated as a global automotive company supply chain is, um, it's almost impossible to even calculate the impact of a tariff because our supply chain has so many tiers to it and goods move all around the world right now. Um, but it's definitely a it's a negative impact. I can't tell you exactly how much. Um, you know, what the industry needs because of the, the time constant on these investments that we make. Building automotive plants is, to build a new one is four or five years. A car program is in design for three years and then in production for five or six years. So it's, call it an eight year investment. When we see things as important as tariffs changing so quickly, there's no way it can't have at least some negative effect on what our what our planning assumptions were. The, the tariffs issue actually um, makes me think of a larger macro issue that's very, very important to GM, which is what's the role of policy and regulations and how does that inform your decision making? A couple of weeks, maybe it was last week even, um, Mary published a letter in USA Today in advance of your earnings call, which was basically a new GM regulatory proposal an open letter to the federal government. Why don't you, if you don't mind, let's just describe a little bit what she had in mind and what that means. So the comment period for the um, review of the fuel economy standards here in the US uh, closed Friday. So we submitted our comments on Friday. As part of that, we advocated for a national zero emission vehicle program. Not exactly the way California does it, but at least to get to a national program. Um, so a couple of points I would make here you know, our input into this policy discussion. One, we never asked for fuel economy targets to be frozen. It would be entirely inconsistent if your vision is zero emissions to say that um, fuel economy standards shouldn't continue to um, move society towards that zero emission future. Um, we as a company have stated publicly on many occasions we recognize the science of climate change. We're not trying to argue against that. Again, that's part of what feeds this vision of zero emissions. What would be helpful though, is to get to a national program um, so that we don't have um, different and sometimes somewhat competing programs inside of the US. So, so we've been very consistent asking for a national program um, we would like to find a way that California and the ZEB states and the federal government come to a, a conclusion. We're hoping that the 
proposal around the national ZEB standard would at least be a step in that direction. Well, that, that would be a good outcome, wouldn't it? It would be a, a good outcome, <laughs> we, yes. We, we will keep trying. Um, overall, well, let me just pivot to another topic, which is the shared economy. Now, I've got, I've got two kids plus a daughter-in-law, so I've essentially got three kids that essentially, when they graduate, and, they both, and, and all three of them went to Stanford, I'm proud to say, when they graduated from Stanford, they moved up to San Francisco, this is a few years ago, they moved up to San Francisco, so my husband and I said, oh, here, we said to Wyatt, here, take the old family car, it was a Prius, you know, ha happy graduation. When our daughter graduated two, two years later, we just said the same thing, so she, we were like weirdly a two Prius family, or maybe not so weirdly, but we were a two Prius family, take the old second Prius, you know, and, with, and, and, and Laura, my, our now daughter-in-law, had a Prius as well, anyway. They were all living in San Francisco, and within a period of a, a couple years, they gave the cars back. They're millennials who were living in an urban setting, and they said, whoa, 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 we've done the math. It's actually more of a pain in the neck than, than not to own a car. And I said, well, what are you guys gonna do? And they said, we take, we take Uber and Lyft. We rent zip cars on the weekends. It's actually really easy. So it's, it's fascinating that, that, you know, again, in my own family experience. Now, what the data says when you zoom up, the analysts who have been thinking about the, the shared economy and, and, with, and shared vehicles in particular, 1% of vehicle miles traveled in 2016 were via rideshare. The forecast is that by 2030, 25% of vehicle miles traveled are gonna be via rideshare. And that has ex incredibly um, important implications if you're in the transportation sector writ large. I mean, if you're a car sharing company, obviously, but if you're an automaker, how does that, how does that impact your vision at GM? So, um, and this is actually one of the areas that GM and EVgo are working together, so I'm gonna ask Kathy to comment as well. But um, we could see a few years ago that sharing was gonna change the business model around at least part of our industry, uh, both ride sharing and car sharing. Um, ride sharing, there were two dominant companies in the US It seemed um, a tall order to try and establish a new ride sharing company because Uber and Lyft were already there. And so we ended up investing $500 million in Lyft um, in order to uh, work with them and understand better the ride sharing industry. Car sharing is a very different business, um, much smaller scale, um, not nearly as much, it's not a two-sided market, so it's easier to get into. And so we established our own car sharing brand, Maven, um, two and a half years ago. Um, and that was our way to learn something about both the sharing economy as well as running one of these businesses. Because to Kathy's point, it will have an impact on how the business of transportation is, uh, is executed going forward. So we started Maven, which started as a very traditional car sharing operation. Put a car in a certain place, let people rent it by the hour, by the day, and use it somewhat similar to your weekend example. As we spent time talking to Lyft, we found out something really interesting, which is that there are lots of people that want to earn money driving for ride-sharing companies, but they either don't have cars that qualify or they don't have cars at all. And so it turned out there was this huge opportunity to make vehicles available to um, gig employees, ride-sharing drivers primarily. And so we started a program that we called Maven Gig, which is targeted to rent vehicles to people that are then gonna use those vehicles in the gig economy. Hugely successful, arguably a much bigger business than the traditional car sharing. And then just recently what we've added is a peer-to-peer -peer component where you, if you own a General Motors vehicle, you can put your vehicle on the Maven platform and make it available for other people to use and you can earn revenue. It's like Airbnb for cars. Same idea. Yeah. So, a variety of different business models. I think you know the one that you, I, you and I talk about a lot and that I find fascinating, we had this idea of Maven Gig, again, where vehicles are being used by, by uh, gig business drivers. We have the Bolt, the Chevy Bolt, 238 miles of range on a charge. And we had some discussion about, well, given that we're trying to move towards zero emissions, shouldn't we put electric vehicles into this Maven Gig fleet? And we had a lot of debate internally about would that really work? Because of course the issue is the folks that are gig drivers, they don't have home chargers. I mean, they're, they're not necessarily sort of the, 
the well-off suburbanite that so often is pictured as an EV owner. In the end, we decided to try it, and it's been honestly a huge success. Um, we have racked up, last time I looked, I think it's somewhere over 25 million electric miles uh, in this Maven gig program. There's some of the most, um, most sought after vehicles we offer on the program. It's very, I think it's an important part of this whole conversation around zero emissions because if you wanna have the greatest impact on emissions and carbon, you wanna put these zero emission vehicles where they'll do the most good. And so you start talking about, instead of the number of vehicles, you talk about vehicle miles traveled. We know from our data that, that these vehicles in the Maven gig program are driven on average more than three times as many miles per day as an EV owned by a retail customer. I mean, the, da the data that we have is that sort of, you know, the, 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 and you've heard this many times, the average personal, personally owned car is only driving 5% of the time, and then the other time it's parked or in your garage or whatever. So it, it's, but what we see is that the, you know, the, the ride share drivers, they're driving 160 to 250 miles a day because they're earning a living driving people from place to place. And then what gets really interesting, so again, back to the charging, they don't have home chargers, so these are folks using DC fast chargers. And not using them occasionally, using them every day. Some of them using them more than once a day. And so we've actually spent a lot of time with EVgo, and uh, because this whole model then becomes really interesting for charging infrastructure, because we can talk to EVgo and say, hey, we're interested in deploying not one or two, but a fleet of electric vehicles in a specific city. Are you interested in perhaps installing some DC fast charging infrastructure so those drivers can, can operate. Yeah, so GM and EVgo have been working together for a year and a half. When, when Maven Gig was invented, GM came to, came to EVgo and said, look, we're gonna, put, we're gonna test this. We're gonna put these cars into the hands of rideshare drivers in Boston, Washington, DC, Baltimore, uh, San Diego, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. Would you be able, can they charge on your public network? And again, EVgo has the largest publicly available DC fast charging network in the country, and just for those of who don't do 24-7 thinking about charging, what most people do when they buy an EV is they plug it into their garage at night, and it charges overnight. It takes somewhere between, depending how big your battery is and whether you're plugging it into a little simple plug or a 240 volt plug, it takes somewhere between four and 12 hours. What these rideshare drivers need for every moment they're not driving and they're charging, they're not making money. They need DC fast, so they need to be able to charge in, in 30 to 45 minutes, and that's, what, that's how quickly the bolt can absorb the, the power at this point. Um, and so that's our network. We're the, you know, EVgo has that network. We're in 34 states and 66 metro markets. So when GM came to us uh, sometime in 2017, we said, sure, let's just make sure we're going to places where we've got enough spare capacity on our network. Fascinatingly, what we saw is that the utilization of our network, and that is how many minutes is a charging station, and it's just like a, you know, it's an outlet, you can see them at Whole Foods all over California. How, how frequently, how many minutes a day is, that, is a car plugged into that charging? Our stations in California went from sort of 15% of the time they were charging a car to over 50%. Based on these rideshare drivers who were, who were coming in and, and charging once, like on average, the data is 1.2 times a day because as Mike says, most of them don't have at-home charging. So the need for convenient, reliable, affordable, fast charging is huge. Well, the program was so successful that, that, that Mike's colleagues came back to us and said, you know what, well, we actually think we need dedicated infrastructure just for our rideshare business, um, in addition to them being able to use your public network. And so we're now in the midst of deploying our first dedicated Maven-only infrastructure um, in a variety of cities around the, around the country. And so to Kathy's point, we now have over 900 Bolt EVs deployed around the country in these Maven gig fleets. And, and Kathy describes very well, it sort of, it breaks this chicken and egg problem with EV public charging infrastructure because typically the charging companies would say, look, we don't want to install infrastructure until we know there are enough cars out there to utilize it. And, and we would typically say, well, we can't sell cars to retail customers until there's charging infrastructure because they're worried about charging. Working together in this very interesting opportunity, we've changed that. And then I think, Kathy, EVgo also sees uh, changes in the medium duty and heavy duty 
That's right. And That's to the right. business as well. So, so we, you know, we have this big public network, and now we're doing dedicated infrastructure for, for General Motors with Maven. And we are also very interestingly, again, seeing incoming requests from, from delivery services, from medium, from medium duty truck companies because they too are placing orders for delivery vans and vehicles that are gonna go, go deliver things around urban areas that again, need, need dedicated charging. Um, and that again, will be a combination of overnight charging and DC fast charging. What's fascinating to me is like when I accepted this offer to go and, and take the reins at EVgo last year, I thought, that, I thought that all of this was going to take much longer. I thought that I, you know, the ride share, we knew it would happen at some point, that's happened more quickly. I thought that the EV sales would, would sort of start to climb, and then I've been watching what's happening with those EV sales and the appetite for that and the costs coming down. And so they're actually, it's actually if you, the, the, the economics, the basic economics of driving an EV have improved so significantly that, that it's being an economic decision maker rather than simply an environmental thing. So the demographic of who is buying EVs is changing. And then, and then this third area, which has actually moved so much more quickly than I had anticipated, was in, is indeed medium and heavy duty. And those are, you know, Ryder, Penske, FedEx, UPS, they are all placing orders for electric trucks that need to be charged. And then there's, again, the extra category that I think some folks have mentioned here is buses, electric buses. Um, Proterra is, a, I think, a, a Bay Area Silicon Valley company. Um, you're an investor, by the way, in you're, Proterra. You're in, and, and their sales are great, and then, there's, then there, there are others. But you have municipalities and then private companies that are actually buying electric buses. So this, we, as I say, we genuinely look at the data in the market. And again, having been a, being a veteran of, of solar and wind and batteries and LEDs, I feel like we're here on the inflection point of the electrification of transportation. And I would add one more thing. Um, first. To your point, I think fleets are going to be a very important part of the EV charging infrastructure story. But then, on top of all the changes Kathy just talked about, layer autonomous on top of it. You know, people keep talking about you need to have a charging a charger available on every street corner, just like gas stations. Well, that's only true because human beings drive to gas stations. As soon as you get to autonomous, I think it changes the fundamentals around how you site and how dense the charging infrastructure needs to be. And from a utility standpoint, with autonomous vehicles, you get the capability then to precisely schedule them to have, so that you can really affect the, uh, the demand through that charging station. And I know some of the utilities we talked to, Patty Poppy, who spoke to the group yesterday, CMS is one of the utilities we work with on trying to understand the utility viewpoint of this coming change in transportation. And just like EVgo as a, an infrastructure provider and GM as an automaker, we, we have a wonderful partnership. We, we, we have that commitment to the same sort of partnership with, with utilities. And, and again, Anne earlier today and Patty yesterday, you know, absolutely what's, what's interesting is when you look at the charging behavior, even without trying to influence when it happens, and the rideshare drivers are actually helping the duck curve in California. Mm -hmm. They happen to charge at a time when there is excess solar because of what they do. Now, if you wanted to affect that with pricing signals and all sorts of things, the world is our oyster. So we've, we've built a software backbone that allows us to do, to do surge pricing if we want to. So there, there, the, there is an enormous amount of opportunity for the electrification for utilities, for car companies, and, and, it's, and what we're simply doing as EVgo is enabling that transformation to happen. Um, just one little quick survey. When do you think, you've now heard a little bit about autonomous vehicles. Um, are we thinking about autonomous vehicles being ready for prime time 2020, 2025, 2030? Um, 2020, hands up. 2025? 2030? Never? <laughs> All right, so everybody, everybody's a technologist in this audience who believes that we can actually get our, I mean, get well, our arms around the safety. And after Chris's presentation, I hope nobody would say never. Yeah, right, that's right, that's right. Well, I mean, because I, I think, I think yes. Mary at GM has said next year, right? She has. So we have uh, said our intent is to deploy autonomous, by the way, EV, because General Motors has said all AVs should be EVs autonomous vehicles in a ride-sharing network, and Chris briefly outlined the economics behind why would you put autonomous into ride-sharing networks first. In a large North American city at scale, again, Chris was a great straight man, um, doing 10 vehicles is not gonna change the world. You gotta be prepared to do tens of thousands. Do all that 
next year. The gating factor is going to be safety. And so we've laid out We've made proposals to the regulators on how do we prove that the autonomous system is safer than a human driver. And we have certain benchmarks within that process we have to hit. But for right now, we're on course. So hopefully next year, you'll be able to go ride in a truly driverless ride-sharing vehicle, EV. Great. Well, we're, we're, we're last point that we'll make and we'll close on because it's, and I'll bring it back to Arun's opening yesterday morning. He had, a, he had a kind of a, a wonderful little chart about by the numbers, and he was looking at emissions and everything else. And again, the bottom line was, we have 20 years. We have 20 years to get our, our greenhouse gas inventory in order so that we actually can preserve the planet for our children and our grandchildren. So my question to, to my final question to Mike is, do you, what, are we on, is the automotive sector, are we on a trajectory where we can achieve that transformation within the required 20 year time frame? So I can't, I don't know the other OEM's plans. Right. I think, I hope I've convinced you that GM recognizes that issue. We're moving very aggressively in 20 years. We're going to have a very different fleet of vehicles um, with a much, much higher proportion of EV and a lot of AVs out there than what we have today. Terrific. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much.